Now, in the remaining minutes of this session, I'm going to call on Thomas Harder, uh, who is going to introduce a Danish analog, we can say, rather than a connection to Patrick Lee Fermor, uh, because uh, although Paddy did come to Denmark once soon after the war, he never expressed any interest in going to Northern Europe again, and therefore we must assume a certain indifference. Uh, but um, of course, the experience of occupation is something we must often be thinking about in thinking, in thinking of, the Gre of the Cretan occupation. Uh, Thomas Harder is, of course, the biographer of one of the great Danish heroes of the Second World War, Anders Lassen, certainly a figure who, had he not been killed so young, might well have become a great writer. Um, who knows? So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Thomas Harder talking about Anders Lassen on Crete. Thank you. <clears throat> so your Majesties, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, those were two hard acts to follow. But I'm very grateful to Chris for having shown us the landscape and given us a sense of the places and not least the distances, which I'm also going to talk a little bit about. And I'm very grateful to Artemis Cooper for this little bit from your book, which made me very happy when I found it, because it said to me, OK, I'm not the only person who has been wondering about what was the point. I mean, you can admire this hussar stunt, as the general called it, or this feat, uh, but you can also wonder what was the point of all this. Uh, and it's a question I've asked myself many a time also reading about and writing about Anders Lassen and many of the operations in which he participated. Operations which from New Year 1941-42 until his death in combat in Italy in April 1945 won him the Military Cross three times and the Victoria Cross and the Greek War Cross. Uh, on many occasions, I've asked myself, well, yes, uh, it's very incredible what they did. It required huge courage. It required great ingenuity. It required uh, a sense of sacrifice. It required uh, stamina, perseverance. But what was it really for? What was the point of some of those operations? Did they have an impact beyond killing one or two Germans or kidnapping somebody, uh, taking away a code book, or sabotaging a radio station. Did it really matter? And if it mattered, did the people who did the actual work and risked their lives and sometimes lost their lives doing that work, did they know why they were doing it? I mean, why they were really doing it? And that's a question which applies very much to Anna's Lassen's first visit to Crete, Operation Albumen, which took place over a period of, uh, well, two, three weeks in June, July 1943. Uh, an operation carried out by 14 members of the British Special Boat Service commanded by Captain David Sutherland, divided into three patrols, two of them commanded by Lieutenants Lassen and Lamonby, and the third one by the third officer, 14 men all in all, 14 British soldiers, and two Greek SOEs operatives who acted as guides and helpers. And just as you showed us, Chris, uh, as the thing progressed, the group grew larger and larger. Local people uh, added themselves to the group. Local SOE people uh, were added to show the way or to procure food and shelter and so forth. But uh, a basic group of 14 soldiers landed on Crete in June 1943, an operation almost identical to one carried out by David Sutherland one year previously, Operation Anglo in 1942. Oh, by the way, these three men were about 22 years uh, old when the photos were taken, Lassen, Lamonby, and Sutherland. But the purpose of Operation Albumen was to land the force uh, here, on the Tripiti beach, you showed us an image of it. There seems to have been quite a lot of traffic going in and out of Tripiti beach. And the force would then split into three patrols, one moving to Timbaki, up slightly to the left, 
one moving up to Heraklion and the far northern end, and one moving to Castelli Pediada, sort of northeast from Tripiti. At all three places, there were German airfields, and the plan was to get uh, saboteurs into the airfields and blow up German aircraft. And this operation involved a march through the mountains, uh, short or long. Uh, Lassen's patrol was the one supposed to attack the Castelli Pediata airfield, and they marched for about one week over mountains like the ones you showed us, not exactly those mountains, but mountains, I suppose, very like those, uh, sleeping in caves, uh, eating food given to them by local peasants and shepherds or brought to them by SOE agents, and always in danger of discovery because local curious people would come to have a look at the Englishmen, and the more Cretans uh, came around, the greater the risk that the Germans would discover what was going on, of course. Uh, but on the 2nd of July, Lassen's force arrived at Castelli Pediata, or at a hillside overlooking the airfield. And they spent a night and a day observing the airfield and making plans. And Lassen divided his force into two groups of two men each. And they would try to enter the airfield, each from uh, their own side. Lassen's, uh, Lassen and his partner got into a very violent firefight with German and Italian guards, whereas the other group, the other two men, managed to cut their way through the barbed wire and get into the airfield and place incendiary bombs on the wings of aircraft parked around the airfield. The aircraft were heavily guarded, and heavily guarded means two or three soldiers actually sleeping next to the aircraft, taking turn at guarding it throughout the night. Uh, but they managed to place bombs on a number of aircraft, and they all managed to get out of the airfield again and disappear into the hills and mountains and uh, get away. The groups that went to Heraklion and Timbaki had less luck in the sense that uh, because of faulty reconnaissance, uh, they didn't know that there were no aircraft at Heraklion and there were no aircraft at Timbaki. So one of the groups blew up uh, some, some petrol they found in the place and the other group just turned back to Tripiti Beach and waited to be reunited with their uh, comrades. And the results of Lassen's attack on Castelli Pediata, well, we know from telegraphs, uh, sent telegrams sent from Crete to the HQ in Cairo that Lassen thought that he had blown up eight German aircraft, which is a bit curious because we know that they managed to plant bombs on five aircraft, so how they could blow up eight is a mystery. Uh, but the Germans noted in their war diary that one aircraft had been blown up, one older, training machine uh, and not four bombers and four dive bombers. And the explanation is probably that, of course, Lassen and his comrades had left when the bombs uh, went off. They were behind the hills. They couldn't see what went on. They could see fire on the sky. And later on, the local Greeks would come around and meet them or meet their radio man who had been left somewhere else and tell them that they were quite sure that eight planes had been blown up and that was the message that would go to Cairo. Actually, one old trainer was blown up and that was that because the Germans had by then learned how to have um, teams ready to move out very quickly and remove the bombs from airplanes and have them detonated at a far uh, safe distance from the aircraft. So if you look across the hills and the mountain tops from afar, you see the explosions, you hear the explosions, and you think that eight aircraft have been destroyed. But that was not the case. Lassen wrote in his report that he shot two guards. The Germans noted that one German guard had been killed and one Italian guard had been wounded. Uh, in Heraklion, 2,000 gallons of petrol uh, were destroyed, and at Timbaki, nothing happened because there was practically nothing to attack. So those were the immediate results, and you may ask yourself, was it worth it? There were also other results in the sense that after the attack, the German commander, Müller, whom we heard about uh, before, the one who did not get 
kidnapped, order the execution of at least 50 and probably more than 60 Cretan hostages who were killed because of these attacks. Um, Lassen radioed Cairo that the Cretans need a morale boost. He realized even before he'd left the island that uh, this had been a hard blow to morale on the island and he asked for uh, air attacks on German installations on the island to somehow boost the morale of the Cretans. This does not happen. And an SOE agent, we don't know who it was, it was not Patrick Lee Firm, it was somebody else, wrote that he really hoped that these attacks had been worthwhile because they had done great damage. Uh, they had, uh, as he said, they had caused much anti-British feeling in the island. But, as he said, it will probably all go away if things go well in Sicily. He wrote that after the invasion of Sicily, which took place on July 10th, that is just after the Castelli attack. And when Lassen and Sutherland and Lamonby and the others landed on Crete, they had no idea that Sicily would be attacked. Nobody outside a very narrow circle knew that. And actually, that was the whole point of the Crete attack. It didn't really matter it didn't really matter whether they blew up one aircraft or eight aircraft or killed one guard or two guards or no guards or all the guards. What was important was that the Germans saw British soldiers moving around Crete and got the impression that Crete was incredibly interesting to the British. And, and at the same time, while this was going on on Crete, a similar operation was going on on Sardinia at the other end of the Mediterranean, an SBS force led by John Verney, who later went on to become a writer of children's book and invented the dodo pad and many other things, uh, tried to get into German airfields in Sardinia and blow up aircraft. And that mission went terribly wrong because of bad planning and malaria, but it did what it was supposed to do. It showed that the British were interested in Sardinia. So the idea was to make the Germans wall-eyed, as it were, and make them look at Sardinia and Crete and Greece instead of looking where they should be looking at Sicily, and thereby being less prepared than they might have been for the invasion of Sicily. So the real objective, the real point of this Hussar stunt at Castelli Pediada and the other two airfields was not really to blow anything up or to kill any Germans. I mean, that would be useful, but the idea was simply to be there and to be seen to be there and to attract attention to that place rather than to Sicily. And the same thing in Sardinia. Uh, from Crete, Lassen and the SBS moved on to take part in what became known as the War of the Aegean, that is the attempt by the British to take control of those islands in the Aegean which were held by Italy before Mussolini's downfall at the end of July and Italy's capitulation in September 1943 to get those islands to occupy them before the Germans could do so. That didn't work, up, uh, work out. The British forces were too weak. Uh, the Germans acted very swiftly and took control of the Aegean Sea and pushed the British out of it and established a defensive perimeter along Rhodos, uh, Carpatos, Crete, and Kitera, and all the way up to the mainland. And in that war for the Aegean, the special boat service, which was bought as a raiding force, that is a hit and run force, get in there, blow something up, kill somebody, get out quickly, were forced to act as infantry to try to hold on to territory and defend against organized attacks. They were not meant to do that, they were not trained to do that, and that was not their mindset. Uh, what they were meant to do, really, and what their mindset made them very good at was what came after. After losing control of the Aegean, the British initiated a guerrilla warfare, seaborne guerrilla warfare, from bases on the Turkish coast. Remember, Turkey was neutral, but allowed the British to use their coast to send uh, patrols into the Aegean Sea and later on even further into Greek waters to attack German garrisons to sabotage German installations and so forth in order to, well, to, to of course, damage the German forces, to gather intelligence, to 
maintain the connection with, with local resistance movements to help prisoners of war who had escaped or other allied soldiers who were stranded behind the enemy lines to get out and also to bring food to starving islanders to bring them over on the British side to pay Greek skippers to bring their ships uh, onto the British side instead of sailing for the Germans and again deception perhaps the most important part of it all, to create the impression that Greece was very important and very interesting to British and Allied strategy, when what was really interesting at that point was France and, uh, of course, the preparations for the Normandy landing. Now, I haven't done any real research into the Kripe abduction, but my guess would be that kidnapping Kripe at that time would be part of a huge deception scheme which spanned all the way from northern Norway through Denmark and France and Greece, uh, all kinds of activities, uh, some very picturesque, some very, uh, very ingenious, other more basic, but all with the purpose of getting the Germans to look everywhere but Normandy. After these um, months and years as a raider, Anders Lassen was given a job which he was not suited for and didn't like. He was put in charge of an improvised military force called Sent Force from the last syllable of his name, uh, which was put together late in 1944. In September 1944, the war was going so badly for Germany that Hitler ordered the evacuation of Crete and Rhodes. All military personnel was to be flown out or sailed out of those islands and brought to, well, to other fronts where they could be more useful. After a couple of weeks, it turned out that that was not possible. There weren't ships enough, there weren't aircraft enough, they were needed elsewhere, and so the German soldiers had to remain in place uh, in those islands. And the German commander in Crete, uh, Major General Bentak, decided that he could not hold on to the whole island. He concentrated his approximately 12,000 soldiers in the northwestern part of the island where he had prepared fortifications uh, that were waiting to be occupied by the German force. And that left the rest of the very large island completely open without any kind of serious military control. There were the two sides of the Greek partisan movement, the communists, which were fairly weak in Greece, but they were well organized and well armed, and they were the, 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 the conservative or royalist forces, which were larger in number but less well organized, and there were all kinds of groups ready to fight for power or just ready to fight each other. And there was the, let's say, the embryo of a Greek um, administration, the royal Greek government backed heavily by the British was setting up a military administration and a civilian administration which was trying to take control of Crete without much success and there was the SOE, Patrick Lee Fermor and his colleagues which were now no longer there to train a Greek partisans or to carry out sabotage, but were acting as a kind of administrators in the island, taking over the administration of what was called Free Crete. And Lassen's force was sent to Crete to protect them, to keep an eye on the Germans, to make sure they stayed within the perimeter, and to keep some sort of order in an island which was full of all kinds of feuds, all kinds of political conflicts, and with lots of weapons and no Germans to control them. That was not the kind of political or police work which Lassen and his comrades were uh, used to. That was not what they were trained to do, and violence escalated throughout the winter. British soldiers were killed, and there was a great deal of bitterness and sourness surrounding the whole thing. And Lassen and his comrades were very happy when they were allowed in February 45 to leave Crete. The uh, command there was taken over, or the, the command of the German British land forces was taken over by a more experienced officer, was the larger force. Lassen was moved to Italy with the SPS to fight in the Adriatic and uh, fought his last battle at Comacchio in northern Italy in April 
the 8th, 9th April, uh, 45, where he was killed in the operation that won him a posthumous Victoria Cross. He's remembered in Komakiu, there's a monument to him, there are monuments around Denmark, there are monuments and uh, memorial plaques at various SAS establishments in Britain and also in Castelli Pedia, that's where this picture was taken in 2006. Uh, there's a picture of him hanging in the local library, and I've been told, but it's a bit hard to get information out of Castelli Pedia, that some local people are trying to raise money for a monument to last. Maybe you can help us, uh, Chris, get some intelligence out of Castelli. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas Harder, for that talk. Uh, presentation of a great Danish hero, and further, an explanation as to why Paddy's exploits were not just a bit of schoolboy showing off, uh, but might have had some part in the greater war strategy. Uh, I would now ask you to, all the audience to rise. Uh, Her Majesties will uh, leave by the uh, back door. Thank you all. <laughs>